Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, yesterday, uh, during his opening remarks, uh, Richard Kerr said that he wants us to think outside the box, to challenge ourselves, even to make ourselves a little bit more uncomfortable than usually, uh, to perhaps push the boundaries of, of our thinking a little bit. So uh, I modestly took on the topic of future of insurance. Uh, but uh, you might say, you know, this guy is an investment banker. What does he know about future of insurance or insurance at all? Uh, so let me explain that. So I, uh, I run Willis Capital Markets and Advisory. And uh, uh, what we are is an investment banking boutique that focuses solely on uh, insurance industry. Uh, we are 100% owned by Willis Group. We have 35 professionals around the world uh, in offices in New York, London, Hong Kong, and Sydney. Um, we provide advisory services in a context of mergers and acquisitions. We help people raise capital, and we securitize insurance risks. So we underwrite and trade uh, ILS. As a matter of fact, we trade roughly a quarter of all secondary trading of, of CAD bonds in the world. Um, now, we compete both with mid-market investment banking boutiques, but also with bulge brackets with the likes of Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. So you might ask, how do you do it with just 35 people and fairly limited infrastructure? Well. We like to think that we are able to do it because we think outside the box. So we challenge ourselves to come up with themes uh, that we see in the industry and help our clients exploit this theme. So I'll give you an example. Uh, it was said here a couple of times uh, in the last two days that there is a huge inflow of Chinese capital into insurance industry in the developed world, in particular in the, in the US. Well, we saw this coming several years back, and we invested heavily in our team in Hong Kong. Now we have nine individuals there, and I would actually argue that that's more in terms of insurance industry-focused bankers than anybody else in the world, in including large bulge bracket investment banks. Now, what it allowed us to do is to be on the forefront of this new trend, new theme. So just this year, we advised Meadowbrook on its sale to Chinese Fosun. It was a half a billion dollar transaction, roughly. Uh, we advised White Mountains on the sale of Sirius to, again, Chinese CMI. That was roughly two and a half billion dollar transaction. Uh, and I can say here that there's no other bank on earth that participated in more insurance-related Chinese investments into the developed world that, that we did. So that's thanks to outside the box thinking. Uh, now, so what I'm going to present today uh, is an attempt to share with you one of the things that we see that will impact the industry going forward. And uh, we hope that understanding the future of insurance will allow us to develop transactional solutions for our clients to exploit it. So, um, future of insurance. We talked a lot here about technological revolution and how to win in the changing environment. Well, the, the answer seems to be pretty obvious and pretty simple. You just have to innovate. So, if you are just a step ahead of your competitors, just one step ahead, you will succeed. You will win the war, right? Now, I wanted to share with you a number of examples of very successful innovators, the companies that were on the forefront of their industries and were very much investing in innovation. First one, Kodak. Uh, I'm not sure that everybody here remembers the company, but it was a pretty powerful business, 150,000 people employed around the world in the 90s. Uh, they were a leader in photography. They developed a lot of interesting, interesting things for photographers. They developed a film in a roll. They pioneered color photography. But most interestingly, 
they actually pioneered digital photography as well. In 1975, they developed a first one megapixel digital matrix to be used in digital cameras. Now, they are not around anymore. So what happened there? It's not because they didn't know about digital revolution. Another one, Digital Equipment Corporation. That one is even older. In 1970, it was the second largest manufacturer of mini computers in the world. Uh, so they actually uh, uh, predicted the demise of mainframes. They said, it doesn't make sense, this huge custom-made computers that are custom-programmed. They have a lot of power, but even if we take a little bit of power out and create machines that are much more standardized and can, can be programmed in a standardized fashion, it will be a winner in the market. They were right. Now, as the next step of the revolution in personal computing came and personal computers were announced or introduced, they got out of the business. And some might argue that uh, change from mainframes to mini computers was much more, much more pronounced than from mini to personal computers. Another one, more modern, Netflix. Uh, so they started by devising a very efficient technology to send us all DVDs. So they pretty much decimated the industry, uh, killed Blockbuster, uh, and they were able very efficiently to send us physical DVDs. We watched the movie, send them back to them, uh, and the process sort of repeated itself. Now, they came up with streaming. They were the first that had commercial streaming technology that could be used for uh, movie streaming out there. Uh, now, they were so enamored with their machine to send DVDs that they said to their customers, well, we have the streaming technology, but you cannot choose which one do you want. You have to take both. Right? It almost took them out of the market again. They realized what they are doing. They uh, emphasize streaming, uh, uh, unbundled the two, and they are a very successful company today. But this decision almost took them out of the business. And then the final example, Walmart. So Sam, Wal Sam Walton uh, was famous of saying, location, location, location. He was renting planes, flying around, looking for spots to be build stores that were, that were the easiest to access, access for, their, for, for, for his customers. Now, how is it possible that the company that was obsessed with accessibility for the customers completely missed internet revolution? Now, there are many more examples uh, that you have on the page here. Now, what I, what I want to say is that Sustaining innovation will not save you from extinction. There is something else to it. So do all leading innovators eventually fail? So I'm, I have here three innovation traps. One, diminishing returns of sustaining innovation. So if you have a mature product, obviously it's much more difficult to improve it. And it costs a lot of money to improve it. Two, resource allocation dilemma. When you have a successful product in the market, obviously you put the best people, the best resources behind that product. You are not going to allocate your best people to some new technology that may or may not succeed. Finally, focus on short-term profit. It's very difficult to cut the branch you sit on. If 90% of your profit comes from a technology and you have a prospect, something that will crowd out this technology from the marketplace, are you really going to invest in that, jeopardizing 90% of your profitability? So it's difficult to be successful innovating over a long period of time, but it is possible. Now, I have a chart here, and I really promise this is the only chart I'm going to show you today. Um, <laughs> and it talks about disruptive innovation. So let's go back to Kodak. So it happens to be that disruptive innovation starts with low quality use. So you have the line here, uh, and that's how it started in digital photography as well. This simple point and shoot cameras that the quality was terrible, the pictures were not sharp at all, colors were pale, it was just really low quality. Now Kodak said, it's actually a blessing for us, right? We make all this money from professional equipment. We have this high quality equipment. It's even better for us that we can differentiate ourselves more from this digital technology than just for the masses. Plus, there's really no margin there. The cheap film, we are not competing there. The margins are low. People are co uh, copying what we are doing. So that's great. Let it go. Well, then came prosumer cameras another line of, on, this, on this chart. And you know, by prosumer, I mean you know, the 
large, almost professional, expensive equipment that guys run around with just for fun, not making any money out of it. Uh, and Kodak said again, I mean, it's not really our core market. Maybe there's some margin there. Maybe it's a testing ground uh, somewhat, but we are not going to play. Now, there was enough margin in point and shoot cameras, mass market, and prosumer market that the companies playing there were able to develop technology to the levels acceptable by professional users. So the innovation came here. Now, the film became obsolete and Kodak got out of the business. Uh, it's actually funny if you look at the you know, last two, three years before the first bankruptcy of Kodak, they were trying to develop a camera that could use both film and digital, digital technology at the same time. That's how much they were focused on selling more film, knowing about digital technology anyway. So it's very difficult, as I said. Now, there are companies that succeed doing that. One great example that, uh, that all of you know, I'm sure, is IBM. So they were an absolute leader in mainframe computing. Now, they allowed their mini computers and personal computer divisions to compete freely with their mainframes. And pretty much got out of mainframe business because of that internal competition. Then, everybody remembers here the little IBM ThinkPad notebooks. So the personal computers that they actually manufactured defined the brand for a long period of time. Now they decided to sell this business to Chinese Lenovo. Then they focus on enterprise software, complex software solution built and customized and proprietary uh, for uh, uh, any specific customer. But then they decided, well, that's not the world, where the world is going and really put emphasis on open source software and pretty much killed the complex uh, um, uh, proprietary software business that they had. So they reinvented themselves so many times in their history that in the process of it became leading innovation consultants for the technology world and not only technology world. So what I'm going to do today is I'll try to convince you that what we see as a technological revolution in insurance is in fact a disruptive innovation that will completely change the underlying function of the industry. So for the last 100, 200, 300 years, insurance industry was around to help people manage volatility, to help people pay for losses. So the primary function of the industry was, and still is, volatility management and loss paying. I think it's going to change. So we talked a little bit yesterday uh, about Internet of Things all these magnificent devices that are designed to make your life better. So let's go through a couple of examples. This is uh, a Nest thermostat. It's actually designed by a guy who invented iPod. Uh, and what it does, it measures temperature and humidity in your apartment. It connects with that database that streams information about the weather outside of your apartment to it. And based on that and uh, checking out if you're actually at home at any given time, uh, is able to devise an algorithm to manage comfortable temperature in your apartment of, of, or house and at the same time save some energy. Now, it collects a lot of information about your house or your apartment and beams it back to a centralized database at Nest. Now, this is its little brother, Nest smoke detector. So it all, what it also does is has a carbon monoxide sensor, uh, measures humidity in a little bit different way, checks if you are around at home, communicates with his uh, thermostat friend, and beams all this data back to Nest database. So all of a sudden, somebody completely outside of the insurance industry is building a database of information that can be very helpful to underwrite fire insurance. This example is very simple, right? Very simple insurance product and very simple technology at heart. So let's go to the other extreme. This is a LG internet fridge. 
It knows what it has inside, therefore it knows what you consume. It will tell you when something perished. If you run out of milk, it will order it for you in an internet store. So it really knows your consumption patterns. It can devise algorithms, or based on the algorithms program to it, it can advise you on how to eat healthier. Now, and sorry about the next example. This is an internet toilet. <laughs> it's a prototype for now. But what it's going to do is going to analyze your waste. Now, it will tell you what your sugar levels are, what your cholesterol levels are. It will tell you if you're pregnant or you are hangovered or two at the same time, perhaps. <laughs> I, I apologize for that. I, I <laughs> couldn't stop myself. Anyway, uh, it, if it's concerned, the toilet that is about your well-being, it will text your physician <laughs> and make an appointment for you to go and check yourself, right? Now, if the toilet starts talking to the fridge, <laughs> You see where I'm going with it, right? They have a lot of information to help you manage your well-being, right? It's very complicated. A lot more information here than in, in my simple uh, smoke detector and, and thermostat example. But you can see a lot of under, underwriting data in this for you know, A&H writers, even life writers, that can be used in insurance context. Again, collected by people that have nothing to do with insurance. So let's talk about Internet of Things a little bit more. Uh, it's, there are three pillars of it, uh, essentially. There are things with network sensors, and we heard yesterday that there are 20 billion things connected to Internet now, and there will be 40 billion by 2020. Then there are data stores and analytic engines, so algorithms that analyze these data stores. The big questions for me about the future of insurance industry are who distributes uh, things, who owns the data, and who has algorithms to analyze that data. Now, let's go to a very simple example, and again, it was used here quite a lot. This is Audi RS7, a very nice car, 560 horsepower, goes to 60 miles an hour in three and a half seconds. Recently, it completed a lap uh, in, uh, on Hockenheim Formula One track, uh, at the time better than any actual driver, and it did it without a driver in it. Now, the more civilized version of the car, uh, and I think we heard about it yesterday, drove by itself from San Francisco to Las Vegas. Uh, to present the technology and commu co uh, consumer electronics show um, uh, in Las Vegas. Now, Audi claims that the technology uh, actually uh, um, developed by Delphi is production ready and can be put in any car at any time, fairly low cost if regulations allow that. Now, this is a Google car. It looks ugly, <laughs> at least for me. Uh, we heard yesterday it covered over a million miles with, I think, 14 accidents, none of the car's fault. Uh, now, there's a, one big difference between this car and the previous car that I showed you, uh, and it's actually quite shocking if you, have a, have a, uh, if you ever have an opportunity to actually sit in one of these, I highly recommend it. Uh, it doesn't have a steering wheel. Now, it doesn't have an accelerator pedal, and most importantly, it doesn't have a brake. So, what it does, it has a screen in front of you that beams information about your surroundings. Well, you're passing by Starbucks, maybe a coffee would be a good idea. You're passing by Walmart, there's a sale of met on mattresses, maybe you need a new mattress. Now, the big thing about that for me is if you think about a car that you sit in and has, can do nothing about where it goes, how fast it goes, and when it stops, it's hard for me to imagine that somebody will ask you to buy insurance for this car in the future. I, I understand the regulatory complexity and legal complexity, but if you sit in this thing, you just cannot imagine that you will be buying insurance for this thing. Anyway, this is Apple car, or a rendering of it. 
there's a rumor out there that by 2020 Apple is going to introduce their own car. I don't know if it's true or not, but just to make the point that the technology is really, really mainstream. So what does it mean to car insurers or for car insurers? I have a little quote here from Allstate 10K. We are investigating, investigating telematics and broadening the value proposition for the connected customer. If we are not effective in anticipating the impact of changing technology, including automotive technology, our ability to successfully operate may be impaired. Now, Allstate writes $18 billion of car insurance premium. That's two thirds of their business. So what are they concerned about? Three steps in which car insurance is going to change, or as a matter of fact, is changing right now. Safety. So when speed limits, highway speed limits were devised, they were calculated based on the assumption that the car needs to stop from 60 miles an hour in 250 feet. Last time I checked, mine stopped at 75. Now, there are many other safety technologies, brakes are obviously better, uh, new grade seat belts, airbags, the car monitors your eyeballs for drowsiness, it will stop itself, whatever else. Enforcement is becoming more technologically advanced, so the system overall is safer. Now, it's estimated that in the next 10 years, because of safety improvements in the system, a third of the premium will walk out the door. So we have a roughly $180 billion market. In 10 years, because of safety improvement, improvements, it's going to be 120. Next, telematics. So this is a technology that allows somebody to monitor your driving habits and the well-being of your car. Now, because of that, others can enforce improvements in your driving habits and underwrite car insurance more effectively. In other words, if you have 10 cars, it's highly unlikely that you drive 10 of them at the same time. Now, you most likely pay insurance now for all 10 based on telematics and the actual understanding by insurance company in, that, in this case, which one you drive and how much the premium that you pay will likely be lower. So again, next 20 years, another third roughly of the premium goes out of the market. So we have $80 billion left. Now we talked about autonomous driving, self-driving cars. So we have $80 billion of premium left. Now, again, if you ever sit in a, in a Google car, you will understand they are not going to be required to buy insurance for it. So I bet that this $80 billion of premium will walk to commercial writers. So from the personal auto insurance uh, uh, perspective, the premium is going to disappear. Now, this is a very convenient example because everybody's talking about uh, car insurance and self-driving cars and it's sort of a sexy topic. But you can imagine the same process happening for different other classes of, of risk. Right? Take the fire risk and the thermostat and, uh, and a smoke detector. The same thing can happen. Right? So PNC companies are really in danger. Now, let's go to my three pillars of Internet of Things. Who distributes things, who owns the data, who has algorithms to analyze the data. First example. This is a little device called Snapshot. It's made by Protective, uh, sorry, Progressive, and distributed by Progressive. What it does is you plug it into your diagnostic port in your car, and it beams certain uh, information to back to Progressive. Originally, it was just three things. Quite surprising, actually. The number of hard brakes, the, number, the amount of uh, time that you spend driving between midnight and 5 a.m., and the mileage that you cover. Now, based on that, Progressive is about to devise better underwriting algorithms and price your car insurance more effectively. Now, the problem that they had was adoption. So if an insurance company sends you something, you're highly suspicious. You think that they are going to raise your rates. Uh, so people didn't like it. So Progressive have to manage around that. They said, well, try it. Take it for 30 days. If you like it, if the newly calculated premium is lower than before, you'll keep it. If not, you'll send it back to us. We'll calculate your premium based on the old uh, methodology. Now, 
that's negative selection at its best, right? Quite a bold bet, by the way, but hard to see how is it going to succeed. Now, there are plenty of telematic sensors in currently manufactured cars. So you have Tesla here, probably an extreme there. It brings a lot of data based to a centralized database. It's sort of sold under the umbrella of diagnostic information, but it analyzes your driving patterns very, very carefully. So it's this funny story, actually, uh, several years back, uh, a Times, New York Times journalist took one of these for test drive and then wrote this article as a terrible car, it broke, it just, it's not going to work. So Tesla went back to this diagnostic information and replicated exactly what he did, how he drove it and how he abused this car. I sent this open letter saying, well, nobody drives like that. You're really trying very hard. You'll kill any car out there with this sort of driving, right? So they have a lot of info. Now, they already have this information. They can look at it. If they apply underwriting technology or mindset rather to it, they can price insurance, perhaps with somebody's help. And they can pick the best, the safest drivers that they have and send them insurance quotes. They know much more than the insurance companies that, un that insure these people now. They will be likely able to first underprice them, but also generate high margins at the same time, and pretty much kill the idea of subsidization of bad driver, but by good driver, for incumbent insurers. So I would say that Tesla and other manufacturers are better positioned than Progressive in this case to win from telematics technology. Now, a third example here, Octo, this is just uh, one of the telematics companies, so a hybrid model of sorts. Uh, basically, what they do is they install telematics technology in cars and help mostly uh, car fleets managers to manage their fleets. So they uh, look after the well-being of the cars, the behavior of the drivers, uh, but they are building an independent database of information that, again, can be used for underwriting. You can easily see how it disintermediates insurers in the future. So I would say, and that's an uncomfortable piece for some perhaps, that I don't think that insurer's standalone model is going to work in this industry anymore. Insurers are just not well positioned to distribute things. And if they don't distribute things, they don't own the data. So if you kind of go standalone, you can partner. Now, you can imagine progressive partnering with, with Tesla, it would be pretty cool, but wouldn't change the industry much. But imagine AIG cutting a deal with GM. That would be a big change for the industry, right? Now, there are three problems, and people tried in the past, as some of you know, I'm sure. Uh, there are three big problems why it's difficult to cut this sort of partnerships. A, you have to share your margin as an insurance company with this newly wedded partner. Two, you actually work proactively to decrease the premium pool, right? You try to teach people to be safer drivers. And three, you annoy everybody that you really care about, and that is your distributors, because you distribute most of your, a large chunk of your pr premium directly. Now, there is another option here, a consulting model. So insurance companies dividing what they do right now into a balance sheet management function and underwriting function. function. Uh, creating this independent pools of capitals. Something that's somewhat happening if in, in, in property cut. Uh, creating this independent pools of capital and separating underwriting services from them and selling them to the likes of car manufacturers. Now that's again a risky bet, but you cannot go alone. So that's how I think insurers should think about car insurance. Now again, this is just an example. You can go through the same logic for any other risk. Take fire risk that I mentioned. So I really believe that the industry is going to get disrupted. Now what about life? So my car dealer called me the other day and he said, well, your car texted me that it needs uh, oil change. I'm like, well, I did oil change 5,000 miles back. 
it's kind of early, but fine. I guess that's what track sessions do to engine longevity. But taking that aside, it, it got me thinking, how is it possible that the well-being of my car is monitored better than my own well-being? This is going to change. And I think that what I described for you for car insurance and fire insurance and other PNC classes, it's going to happen in life as well. So a subset of Internet of Things uh, that I show here is wearables. So basically devices that you wear that have different sensors that are able to collect information about your well-being. Now the difference between wearables and Internet of Things more broadly is that Internet of Things and the devices that I described for PNC in the PNC context are designed to make your life easier. Now, wearables are designed to make your life longer. It's a very important distinction. As a matter of fact, uh, Apple CEO, Apple, a producer of a manufacturer of Apple Watch, said that it's a device that is designed to change the way we live our lives. It's a bold statement. Uh, but what's important about Apple Watch is the first wearable that's actually mass marketed. So Apple sold 5 million of, of these already uh, since April. It's estimated that they will sell 30 in year 2016. So there will be a lot of people with different sensors on their wrist that will measure how many steps they take, their heart rate, how long they sit, where they are. Based on that, again, you can devise algorithms to help us live healthier lives. Now, you say, a well, number of steps, it's kind of mon mundane, what can you do with that? So, let's take an extreme example here. Would you like to go for a run in the morning and monitor your heart rate, your cadence, the length of your stride, lactate acid production, and beam all this data to a software platform that in real time devises a new training program for you that makes you li uh, run faster, but also healthier, injury-free. That would be cool. Well, I do it every day, courtesy of this little Garmin watch, yours for $350, and a set of sensors from a company no uh, named BSX Insight. It can be yours for 500 bucks. So certainly mainstream, a lot of data collected there. There are billions of wearables out there. We cannot even imagine the uses, right? Uh, there will be even more in the future. One thing is certain that not all of them will be distributed by insurance industry. It's likely that a small percentage of them will be distributed by insurance industry only. Now, there's one thing that people often quote as a potential roadblock for the growth in wearables and usability of wearables in life and health insurance, that's privacy. Why would we allow anybody to actually monitor us all the time? The answer is very simple. Again, when I talked about PNC in the context of Internet of Things, it's where things to make your life easier. Wearables are supposed to make your life longer, and we are going to, be, uh, we, we humans, <laughs> are willing to go a long way to make your life, make our lives uh, longer. So I actually read this uh, study recently that 68% of people or employees in the US, based on some sample, uh, wouldn't mind having a wearable device from their employer that would allow them to do three things. Cut health insurance premiums, cut life insurance premiums, and device a strategy for healthier living. Almost two-thirds of people. So again, I think that we have limited attention span as far as making life easier is concerned. Probably won't be able to read that, and I cannot read it either, but the picture on the left side says, after the first few floods, our insurance provider insisted on future uh, proofing our house. So, you know, you can see how in a PNC context, you very quickly get to an absurd, and people will just reject it. Now, in the life context, uh, picture on the right side, it says on average, a woman lives seven years longer than a man. So when I'm 70, I'm going to have a sex change. So <laughs> we are willing to do a lot to extend our life. 
Now, end of illness, another sexy topic and uh, sort of in a, in a color, colorful press. This is a cover from Time magazine. It was an article a couple of months back asking if this cute little baby can live to be 142 years old. Then Bloomberg Business Week ran a study or an article asking if this lovely older woman can live to see her 173rd birthday. So the premise behind both of them is this newly developed drug, antibiotic from device from dirt samples from Easter Island that is extending, is able to extend mice life by 30%. And it's believed that can do the same thing for humans. Now, so this is a big deal for life insurers, right? But it's something that can be easily managed. So, you know, maybe there will be more of a step function to mortality tables improvement, maybe. But the life insurers are dealing with mortality improvements all the time. They will manage through. Now, the disruptive change goes back to the same trends that I described for PNC insurance. So there are three drivers of our longevity. Our behavioral choices, so with wearables, education, we can have more healthy lifestyles, use preventive medicine better, and live longer. Two, genetic predispositions. And again, I'm uh, conveniently parking regulatory, ethical, legal complications behind that. But we are very well positioned now to predict people or a person's longevity based on their genetic information. And genetic information is actually quite cheap and available. So almost a million Americans uh, sequence uh, their genome already. It costs $1,000, down from $10 million 10 years ago. So you can see how you can use genetic information to extend your life. And three, medical advances. Somewhat because of the behavioral choices and data that we have, somewhat because uh, we understand our genetic predispositions uh, better, but also technology overall. There are new drugs coming to the market every day, more targeted therapies. You can see how we are getting closer to this holy grail of youth, elixir, and end of illness. So if you think about these three categories, there's a lot of data behind them. It's much more complex than a toilet and a fridge, and certainly much more complex than a car. So the ecosystem of companies that have to collaborate in this space is much greater, greater than PNC. You have life insurance, you have health insurance, you have healthcare providers, things manufacturers, pharma. Now, one thing I'm sure about, and that's in life more than PNC, it will be much more difficult for insurers to go alone. Now, I promise I'm not going to show you another chart. So I tricked you a little bit because I'm going to use the same. Uh, <laughs> remember when I was, I was talking about Kodak and how from this low quality use, the revolution started that killed them eventually when the product uh, was mature and more sophisticated. I can use this chart to talk about future of insurance. So you have low quality use, car insurance, different PNC classes higher, and we get to life and health up here. The same disruptive change as we master data analysis is becoming more and more relevant to more complex insurance products. Now, I started by saying that the objective, or the primary objective of insurance industry for hundreds of years was to pay claims and manage volatility. I fundamentally believe that what I described is going to change it. And the primary function for the industry will be mitigate risk. Now, insurance companies do it a little bit today, but imagine a mind shift it requires to move from paying claims, collecting premium, to managing, mitigating risk, and trying to, 
together with your customers, come up with the idea how to minimize the pool of premium. Now, disruptive innovation is very difficult to manage. You are cutting the branch that you are sitting on somewhat. But it is possible. You just have to use your skills to reinvent yourself and not let the same skills to stop you, uh, to, to, to keep you fighting for, uh, against the inevitable. So I really believe that we are in the moment in time that will decide whether the insurance industry exists in 50 years and we still have progressives, Excels and AIGs of the world, or all these products are provided by the likes of Googles and Yahoo's and other e-companies. So there's a little parallel that I will leave you with. Again, I don't know if you were able to read this. You know, that's what Lyon says. You know, there was a time there about 40,000 years ago when we could have completely wiped them humans out if we put our minds to it. I think insurance industry is the lion from this picture right now. So thank you very much.